All right. Thanks, Rod. It's always a pleasure to come back and talk. Uh, this is you know, one of those rare opportunities where both neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons have the chance to discuss things, and uh, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's also one of the few times that I've actually been to Seattle in August when it's not incredibly sunny outside. It's uh, a different different uh, climate today for some reason. <laughs> so uh, these are my disclosures. So we're going to start out with a couple definitions. Uh, you may hear cervical spondylosis, and you know what is cervical spondylosis? It's, it's degenerative disease that leads to spontaneous fusion and immobilization. It's the body's natural mechanism to compensate for uh, pathology in the spine and to it naturally will stabilize itself uh, in order to uh, uh, accommodate some instability that could be developing or disbase collapse, the general active process of degenerative disc disease. And a myelopathy is the functional disturbance uh, in the spinal cord, or it could describe the pathology uh, in the spinal cord itself. Um, so uh, advanced spondylosis leads to myelopathy, and, and uh, important to uh, understand, understand that. So uh, some, some of the standard uh, anatomical features of the cervical vertebrae uh, uh, the uh, uncle vertebral joint uh, and its hypertrophy is often the culprit for uh, myelopathy and uh, the onset of cervical stenosis. And uh, very important to uh, uh, understand where the pathologic uh, areas uh, come about because when we plan surgical treatments, we're going to be uh, looking at that pathology and trying to uh, understand uh, the best and optimal way to treat it. So how does one progress from uh, the stage on the left uh, to the stage on the right? Uh, as you can see, uh, it all reflects upon a loss of anterior column height. Um, and uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the most mobile segments uh, of the spine or the area that we utilize the most, uh, five, six, and six, seven, are always going to be the initial ones that are subjected to this degenerative change with disc base collapse. And uh, what happens is as the disc base collapses, uh, the bone remodels. And, uh, and the bone remodels in a way to uh, stabilize the spine and immobilize the spine. And in the process of the disc base collapsing, you end up getting uh, stenosis. Uh, so. Uh, as you can see on the left, uh, these are not just discs, these are osteophytes, and, and the osteophytes are hard substances uh, which are in contact with the spinal cord and uh, are the reasons for the development of, of myelopathy. So uh, the, uh, the active spondylosis uh, results from dehydration of the disc space, collapse of the disc space, uh, the process starts at the level of the nucleus pulposus, uh, and then uh, you end up getting bulging of the annulus, uh, and uh, this leads to mechanical stress and disc degeneration. Uh, the important point to realize uh, is the fact that uh, bone grows in the direction of the disc. Uh, when you have a disc that bulges, the bone above and below the disc grows in that direction, and that's why you have osteophytes that form. So, uh, so the disc base collapse uh, directly uh, results in bone remodeling, and that remodeling of the bone follows the disc. So the first thing that breaks down is the disc, and the second thing that happens is the uh, movement of bone or growth of bone in the direction of that disc uh, uh, migration. So, uh, so, so this is uh, why we have uncinate hypertrophy, uh, because uh, the disc base is right next to the uncinate process, and as the disc base collapses, the bone grows, and it grows in the direction of the of the of the disc. And uh, important uh, feature to always check for is ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, as this may have an influence on. Uh, the type of approach that we select and uh, as far as anterior versus posterior. So uh, 
Uh, with regard to the uh, pathophysi pathophysiology of myelopathy, uh, it's not just the stenosis that causes the myelopathy. Uh, so myelopathy is a multifactorial process. You can have static compression of the spinal cord, which can cause myelopathy, uh, but you can also have dynamic features. You know, what if you have stenosis in the conjunction of uh, motion? So motion plus stenosis equals worsening trauma to the cord. Uh, and it's not just uh, dynamic features and, uh, and uh, static mechanical factors that, comp that cause myelopathy. Uh, it's also potentially a ischemic aspect. Uh, so you may have uh, motion, uh, you may have calcification, you may have diabetes, you may have a compromise of the vasculature that supplies the spinal cord. Uh, so all three of these things work together to, to uh, have an impact uh, on, the, uh, on the health of the spinal cord. So uh, congenital canal stenosis refers to a spinal canal that's, that's uh, less than 13 uh, millimeters. Uh, ideally, a spinal canal should be greater than 13 millimeters. So if you look at the spinal canal and notice that uh, the uh, canal uh, width is less uh, than the uh, AP width of the vertebral body, uh, there's a good chance that that patient has uh, uh, congenital canal stenosis or cervical stenosis. Uh, and so uh, that in conjunction with the routine degenerative changes such as uh, ligamentous hypertrophy uh, or anterior height collapse resulting in kyphosis uh, with possible subluxation can all be additive. So this is what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, if you look at uh, scheme A, uh, you'll notice that B refers to the AP diameter of the vertebral body. And notice that uh, under normal circumstances, A, uh, the spinal canal, and B are approximately equal. Uh, and that's how things should be in an ideal scenario. And, and, and that's why uh, x-rays are potentially useful in the assessment of uh, spinal stenosis. Um, so uh, you may uh, be able to get an x-ray and, and look at the spinal laminar line uh, and, and, and then measure that distance uh, to the posterior wall of the vertebral body. And, and you would, will notice that, that, uh, that A would be less than B and as such, uh, that would be indicative of cervical stenosis. So it's not just an absolute measurement. Uh, you know, you can do a relative measurement just by looking at the uh, AP distance of the vertebral body uh, and comparing that to the uh, AP distance of the spinal canal. And if they're uh, approximately uh, equal, then that patient is unlikely to have uh, cervical stenosis, but if there's a substantial difference between A and B, um, then you could uh, uh, make note of that. So uh, as you can see, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, hypertrophy of the uncle vertebral joint uh, and uh, the uh, uh, osteophytic degeneration of the disc space uh, leads to uh, ongoing cervical stenosis uh, and uh, certainly uh, it causes uh, cord compression. Uh, and uh, the important thing is that vasculature is also involved in it. So it's not just cord compression, it's compression of the vasculature and hence the compromised blood flow that leads to myelopathic changes. So uh, a simple side profile uh, or a lateral profile of a cadaveric specimen uh, looking at the neural foramen uh, uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, neural foramen uh, is, is uh, certainly uh, compromised with uncinate uh, hypertrophy. Uh, and uh, and uh, this, this uh, comes in uh, handy, no, seeing this, this schematic uh, uh, really looks, makes you realize that when you're doing a foramenotomy or like a posterior decompression or even a anterior decompression trying to target the neural foramen. It's, it's the superior articular process uh, 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 that is the culprit very often of the stenosis. Uh, so you can see the majority of the stenosis is happening, let's say for instance, at the C5-6 disc space. Uh, 
it's it's happening from the C6 at the level of the C6 uh, area. Uh, so so there's more of a of a uh, tendency for the caudal portion of the inner space to cause the stenosis, and that might be a good thing to remember uh, during during decompressing. So uh, so uh, again. Uh, if, if you have uh, coexisting factors such as ligamentous hypertrophy, uh, extension and the buckling of the ligamentum flavum is gonna result uh, in, in uh, stenosis or compression of the cord. Uh, if you have anterior disease uh, with osteophytes uh, coming off the back of the disc base, flexion is gonna result in compression of the cord. And so, uh, all of these factors play a role because uh, patients uh, often with degenerative disease have circumferential uh, pathology and, and this all plays a role in helping us decide whether to do anterior versus posterior versus both. Uh, so uh, something to, to consider. So as far as the dynamic mechanical factors, you can see, uh, again, with flexion, it's the osteophytes in the front that are causing most of the damage or the compression of the spinal cord. Uh, with extension, it's the buckling of the ligamentum flavum that is uh, leading to uh, the mechanical disruption of the spinal cord. And so, uh, you know, th this is uh, 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 the uh, natural uh, posture of, of, uh, of a person with severe ligamentous hypertrophy is to remain in the flex position. You know, you want to, uh, they're trying to avoid the buckling of lig ligamentum flavum uh, in order to reduce uh, the onset of symptoms. Uh, so going back to the ischemic nature of myelopathy, uh, there's either direct compression of the vessels or reduced flow uh, or venous congestion. All of these features can result in vascular uh, etiology uh, of, uh, of myelopathy. And so the oligodendroglia are particularly susceptible to injury from the vascular insult associated with these degenerative changes on the spinal cord. And so you can review the vasculature of the spinal cord and you can see uh, particularly at the uncle level of the uncovertebral joint, uh, you have the, the uh, anterior uh, uh, radicular arteries that are supplying the ventral portion of the spinal cord, and then you have the posterior radicular arteries that are supplying the posterior aspect, and, and uh, our natural degenerative processes are very much uh, 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 causing compression of these vascular structures, and, and uh, certainly uh, uh, I think a, a vascular phenomenon is a main contributing factor, and that's probably why fusions uh, uh, work well, uh, even if the decompression is not perfect, because there no longer is that mechanical instability and perhaps less of a vascular insult when you have stability in an area where there is limited blood flow. So what are uh, typical signs and symptoms to look out for for myelopathy, gait abnormalities, weakness, proprioceptive loss, spasticity, loss of manual dexterity? Uh, so you can orient your questions on the uh, history to uh, uh, subtleties that patients might not realize that they have. You know, do you have you had increased difficulty, you know, buttoning your buttons? Have you had increased difficulty with your handwriting? All of these are subtleties that that they may realize in retrospect that uh, are leading to uh, symptoms of, of myelopathy. So uh, other things to check for in physical examination are signs of upper motor neuron uh, dysfunction uh, uh, and uh, uh, Lermite sign. Uh, lower motor neuron dysfunction is also important to investigate uh, and the, uh, the main uh, reason to investigate that is the presence of both upper and lower motor neuron may uh, indicate the presence of something else, such as ALS. So, uh, so, and additionally, ALS can also happen to uh, present with tongue fasciculations. Uh, so, there are other factors that really need to go in your head 
uh, with regard to a patient that presents with cervical spondylitic myelopathy because this may be a manifestation of a, uh, uh, another entity such as vitamin deficiency, HIV-related myelopathy, you know, so there are a variety of, of things in the differential diagnosis that, that you need to consider before uh, really concluding that it's the, the, uh, the stenosis that is the, uh, the etiology. Uh, so having that as a background, uh, it's important to also realize that we have grading scales for myelopathy uh, and uh, the NURIC disability score and the Modified Japanese Orthopedic Association score are routine uh, scales that we use to assess uh, these, these patients and uh, they will have implications upon your ability to predict uh, the uh, potential outcome from surgery. Uh, and uh, other things to look for are signal changes uh, within the spinal cord. As you can see, there's very often bright T2-weighted uh, signal, and, and this, I think, is a manifestation of the ischemic change uh, that occurs uh, from the uh, stenosis. Uh, and uh, so uh, very important to get dynamic x-rays to get a better understanding of whether or not the uh, myelopathy is due to uh, instability uh, and uh, uh, MRI is also uh, critical to get, have an accurate assessment of where the most critical level of stenosis is. Uh, CT is also very important because you get a better idea about whether or not the ligaments are ossified and whether or not there is presence of the ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. And so uh, I think with those three imaging modalities, um, uh, you, you will have a very solid uh, understanding of, of uh, what potentially to do. Uh, EMG, somatosensory evoked potentials are also uh, poten uh, so something that you can use to uh, uh, help differentiate cervical stenosis cases from cases uh, that you may be concerned about with regard to uh, MS or ALS. Uh, so uh, if there's ever a question about what, what a patient may have, uh, I suggest that they undergo these studies to rule that out as a process uh, before you do a surgery on someone who may have a, uh, a, uh, a uh, neuromuscular uh, condition such as uh, uh, MS or ALS. And so uh, imp important to mention that uh, non-operative treatment is, is an option. Um, and. Uh, 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 patients especially who have multiple comorbidities and in whom uh, surgery may not necessarily be the wisest choice. Uh, very often you can get pretty far with simple things such as medication uh, or uh, behavior modification. Uh, uh, you know, injections are controversial and, and may or may not be uh, useful, but for the treatment of radiculopathy, they, they potentially uh, could be useful, but usually the effects are uh, fairly short-lived. So uh, when do you consider operative intervention? When you have severe or worsening neurological deficit, uh, when you have uh, uh, the need to decompress the spinal canal due to uh, uh, pr uh, presence of stenosis that, uh, with symptoms that are, are, uh, are not uh, uh, improving with, with conservative management uh, when you have evidence of instability on exam uh, or on uh, flexion extension dynamic x-rays, uh, uh, you know, that's when stabilization becomes uh, particularly important. So, so now we come to the question of is it anterior versus posterior versus both? Uh, in general, uh, it relays, uh, this very often has to do with where the pathology is. Is the pathology in the front? Is the pathology in the back? Uh, anterior pathology very often is best treated through an anterior approach. Uh, posterior pathology is best treated with a posterior approach, but very rarely is the pathology purely anterior or purely posterior, and uh, as such, uh, it, it may uh, potentially be amenable to either uh, approaches or uh, both. Uh, uh, for a posterior approach, you have either laminectomy with or without instrumentation or possibly a laminoplasty, and we'll go over uh, the decision-making process as to who could potentially be a candidate for laminoplasty. And uh, 
Uh, so uh, the decision making also involves the number of levels that are involved, the greater number of levels involved, uh, the more likely you may consider a posterior approach or a combined approach, uh, the alignment of the spine, uh, the reducibility of the spine uh, also plays a role in, in whether or not you uh, may consider an anterior versus posterior approach. If they have a fixed kyphotic deformity, uh, an anterior approach is going to be obviously pertinent uh, in reconstructing the anterior column. So uh, uh, again, ventral discs or osteophytes, anterior approach. Uh, if you have buckling of the ligamentum flavum, posterior approach. If they have maintenance of their cervical lordosis, uh, they may be a, can a candidate for a, for a laminoplasty. So uh, the cervical spine alignment uh, is, is uh, important to obtain uh, because uh, if you have kyphosis, uh, uh, a posterior approach is usually not uh, the best uh, method. Uh, uh, important to realize that the spinal cord is resting against the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies uh, when you have kyphosis. And, uh, and when you have kyphosis, uh, you have stretching of the spinal cord. Uh, this is a uh, depiction from uh, one of Charlie Kuntz's papers uh, looking at this uh, phenomenon. And uh, you can see uh, that green uh, representation of the spinal cord, and you see the dots uh, that are labeled. Uh, uh, at the, when the patient has normal cervical lordosis, the distance between the dots uh, is very low, uh, and when you have kyphosis, you can see that there's a, a fairly profound stretch to that spinal cord. Uh, so it's just something to realize that, that the, the, uh, the reconstruction of lordosis uh, has a profound impact on uh, the stretch of the spinal cord and its potential uh, uh, for uh, reduction of myelopathic symptoms. Because if you fuse a patient into kyphosis, you may get some partial resolution of the mechanical aspect, uh, but you're not really getting a good decompression anteriorly because the spinal cord is still going to be resting against the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, uh, and you're still going to have a stretch to the spinal cord and uh, therefore a potentially a compromised uh, vascular uh, uh, ischemic uh, type of myelopathy that will that will persist despite the presence of, of the fusion. So segmental distraction uh, is good for the neural foramen uh, as far as uh, you getting an indirect decompression. Uh, however, uh, uh, that may also distract the spinal cord the same way we were looking at this previous slide uh, with the stretch that can occur with uh, the uh, kyphotic change. If you put in a very big graft in the front uh, and you, s you stretch the uh, posterior elements apart from each other, you you'll get a good neural foraminal decompression, but, but you're going to be stretching the spinal cord and, and that's, that's actually not, not ideal. So. Uh, when, when putting in uh, these uh, uh, structural allograft spacers or peak, allog or peak spacers, uh, important to choose a lordotic uh, graft uh, in order to minimize that posterior stretch uh, to reconstitute the cervical lordosis uh, to obtain uh, a, a more physiologic anatomic uh, uh, lordosis. And so, uh, furthermore, with uh, anterior plating, you want to try to keep the plate as close as possible to the disc space that you are trying to fuse uh, to prevent uh, the development of adjacent segment degeneration at the levels above. So if that plate is uh, longer than uh, what is depicted here, it's going to lead to to premature degenerative changes uh, above. So all of these are the goals of posterior stabilization. So you want to restore the spinal stability, reinforce that posterior tension band, uh, prevent or correct a posterior deformity. But it's, that's only in a patient who has a, a flexion extension film that shows that that patient can achieve lordosis. If they can achieve lordosis with extension, uh, 
uh, then that patient is potentially treatable through a posterior approach. But uh, very often, uh, that's not the case where the lordosis cannot be reconstituted through simple extension. And uh, that's when uh, the anterior approach becomes uh, more, more indicated. So, uh, so uh, this is the evolution of uh, stabilization techniques as we learned from Dr. Theodore's talk, uh, wiring uh, is still part of our, uh, our uh, armamentarium for uh, instrumentation, and, uh, and especially in the pediatric population where you don't have uh, solid fixation points, uh, wiring uh, uh, plays a role still. Even though it's part of the original uh, evolution of instrumentation, uh, it's not necessarily uh, something that has been abandoned. It's still still important. Um, so uh, uh, the evolution, as you can see, has progressed to a uh, very easy to use uh, lateral mass screw uh, uh, systems, which are now FDA approved finally. Uh, and, uh, and so as you can see, a, a construct such as this one, it's, they're, they're very straightforward and, and, uh, and uh, easy to perform. Uh, you may be familiar with the variety of the different lateral mass screw trajectories. Uh, uh, the important point is that uh, uh, all of these work, uh, and uh, uh, my, my preferred trajectory uh, follows the uh, angle of the lateral mass itself, and uh, uh, I'll very often, and I, I'll, I usually teach this in the lab, uh, I'll put a Woodson into the facet joint, uh, that Woodson will show me the trajectory uh, of the lateral mass, and your lateral mass screw uh, just follows the trajectory of that Woodson, uh, and uh, and that will be your guide. So uh, uh, you can see if you follow that arrow in the sagittal, uh, you can make your measurements uh, using a preoperative sagittal CT to determine uh, the length of the of the lateral mass screw. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's a fairly for, forgiving screw as as far as uh, uh, the the breadth of the lateral mass. There's a, a wide amount of room in that area, uh, and these screws can can uh, if they're projected to the superior lateral aspect of the lateral mass in that orientation. There's a fairly good amount of latitude that you have to safely put these screws in, uh, and uh, it's a very uh, uh, excellent. Uh, uh, technique. Uh, bicortical fixation is stronger uh, than monocortical fixation, but it's not always necessary depending upon the patient's bone quality. Perhaps those with osteoporosis would benefit from bicortical fixation. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, a, it's a, basically a workhorse for posterior uh, surgery. So laminoplasty uh, uh, is an alternative to lamifusion. Uh, uh, you could potentially avoid uh, some uh, potential uh, uh, complications uh, that are associated with long segment uh, uh, posterior cervical fusions. You preserve some mobility uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, basically allow the spinal cord to drift away from anterior pathology, but that's uh, only feasible if you have uh, lordosis. You know, if you have cervical kyphosis and you do a laminoplasty, uh, the cord isn't really going to drift away that much uh, because it's still going to be sort of draped over the uh, uh, posterior portion of the vertebral body. So laminoplasty only really works when you have lordosis. And uh, furthermore, laminoplasty uh, is a, uh, a technique that is uh, very often considered when you have uh, uh, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament where you have multiple levels that are involved. And if you still have preservation of your cervical lordosis, uh, laminoplasty might be uh, something to consider. Uh, uh, one of the potential benefits of the laminoplasty in comparison to a posterior lamifusion uh, is uh, uh, protection from spinal uh, epidural hematoma that can potentially happen if you have a lamina there. Uh, it's, uh, it's a potentially protective. Uh, 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 however, uh, 
uh, you must remember that there is the risk of development of kyphosis. Uh, uh, this is a patient who's had post-laminectomy kyphosis just from multiple uh, laminectomies. It's more common to have post-laminectomy kyphosis uh, when you uh, are younger in age. Uh, the younger you are, uh, especially in the pediatric population, if you have, have had multiple laminectomies, say for instance for the uh, removal of an intradural tumor, uh, uh, there's a higher incidence of uh, post-laminectomy kyphosis, so it may be advisable to do a laminoplasty at the time of a tumor uh, removal, for instance, like an intradural tumor, tumor removal. So uh, laminoplasty uh, disadvantages uh, is that you, you, you get an indirect decompression of the spinal cord, not, not a direct decompression. Uh, it potentially can result in more neck pain. Uh, it results, you start out with a patient who has normal lumbar or normal cervical lordosis, uh, and uh, you still have lordosis, but it's decreased lordosis. And uh, so you, you sacrifice some of your lordosis when you do a laminoplasty, and there is decreased range of motion. Uh, and depending upon what kind of technique you use, if you do an, a, uh, the most common technique is the, the uh, open door. Uh, technique and and that is taking the spinous processes and 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 they're opening the door on one side and splitting them over to the other side uh, so it's not a normal reconstitution of the posterior tension band so it's just not not a perfect uh, reconstruction uh, of the uh, of the cervical uh, posterior musculature and ligaments uh, so, uh, so what are the indications? Congenital stenosis, uh, myelopathy, OPLL, uh, but you got to have maintenance of your uh, uh, lord of your lord lordosis. Uh, so, uh, when is it contraindicated? Uh, if you're going to have a fixed uh, kyphosis uh, or severe kyphosis or spondylolisthesis, you're not going to want to do a laminoplasty. It's it's uh, definitely contraindicated. Uh, it's basically a patient who has uh, pure myelopathy, minimal radiculopathy, good cervical lordosis. And so once you find all of those conditions, uh, those patients are fairly rare. So it's, it's hard to find a good candidate for a laminoplasty. I think probably the best candidate for a laminoplasty is someone who's getting a intradural tumor removed. That's when you have, you know, a good reason to just reconstruct the lamina uh, and, uh, and, and, and basically restructure the posterior aspect of the spine. Uh, uh, and also for patients who have, you know, I've, I had once a 17 year old with a congenital canal stenosis uh, and he had pure myelopathy. I did a laminoplasty for him and he, he did a lot better. So th this is the open door laminoplasty technique. As you can see, the spinous process gets tilted over to the other direction and, uh, and it's just altered anatomy uh, slightly and, and, uh, and uh, it's just not, not perfect uh, reconstruction of the posterior tension band, but still better than no lamina. Uh, this is the French door uh, uh, technique uh, where you split the middle, make a little troughs on both sides. Uh, again, you're, you're also not creating a normal posterior tension band uh, because of that split in the middle and, and, and that's essentially preventing you from closing the muscles totally uh, uh, as they you would normally do. So. So again, laminoplasties I think are very limited in, in their indications. Uh, and there's a fairly high uh, uh, concern for the possibility of a, uh, a C5 palsy in the laminoplasty literature. Uh, this comes from posterior drift of the spinal cord after you release uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the spinal cord and allow the spinal cord to drift back. You're stretching the C5 nerve roots and, and uh, puts the patient at risk for a C5 uh, palsy. So uh, important to, to realize that uh, all of these techniques are options and uh, 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 very often it's, it's a, a circumferential approach that may be required. Uh, uh, very important to get a preoperative grading of the cervical spondylitic myelopathy to help you predict 
to what degree the patient may uh, positively respond to surgical intervention. Uh, this is a recent study uh, showing that uh, the, uh, the NURIC uh, grade uh, was predictive of better outcome uh, after surgery. So patients with a NURIC grade two did better than uh, patients with more advanced uh, uh, myelopathy. Another uh, paper uh, demonstrating uh, that, uh, uh, that the Modified Japanese Orthopedic Association score uh, was uh, 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 predictive of uh, outcome. Uh, cord signal change uh, was not necessarily predictive of outcome. Uh, so a patient, you may, I've been at lectures and other talks where uh, some uh, people claim that if the patient already has cord signal, the damage is done and, and there's not uh, you know, much potential utility in doing surgery. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, I, I think patients with cord signal uh, are, are still very good candidates uh, uh, if they have a, uh, especially if they're if they're uh, 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 cervical spondylitic myelopathy score is 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 low. So uh, so a couple cases. Uh, uh, this is a uh, at University of Maryland. We have a very high. Uh, incidence of patients with IV drug use and, and uh, discitis and osteomyelitis. And, and uh, this happens to be a, a, a patient who ended up having discitis uh, and, uh, and resultant osteomyelitis. And he ended up having uh, this, uh, this spontaneous fusion between C3 and C4. And so, so you can see this, this patient has a fixed uh, uh, kyphosis. Uh, right at that area, and and uh, the measurement of the spinal canal distance uh, is uh, 5.8 millimeters. So uh, I think I, I bet you I, I bet you I did this case with Justin. I, I think <laughs> uh, uh, this this actually this gentleman actually was not an IV drug user. Uh, he was an unfortunate gentleman who uh, developed a very bad infection in his hip after having uh, multiple uh, transfusions. Uh, and uh, this was done in, in South Africa. Uh, and uh, he had such a severe uh, infection of his hip, they had to remove his hip arthroplasty. Uh, he had it reinserted and that got reinfected again. They removed it again. And so he was left without a hip, basically. Uh, and then developed uh, 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 osteomyelitis and discitis at this level. And this is how he presented to me. He had some relatives in Bethesda, and, and he came over uh, to the emergency room at the University of Maryland. And, and, uh, and so, so you can see, so with this severe uh, kyphosis, uh, what, what do you think? What are your thoughts on the approach for this? Would you be a, a candidate for... Posterior, anterior, yeah. So, so this is obviously fixed kyphotic angle. It's going to need uh, uh, anterior reconstruction uh, at the very least. And so, uh, these are uh, flexion extension films. Uh, there's no instability, uh, and there's furthermore there's no correction of his fixed kyphosis. Uh, he's got, uh, you know, a pretty tight uh, canal. Uh, in that area, uh, and uh, and so b bottom line, uh, this is someone who needed a lot of help. Uh, he uh, ended up having a corpectomy uh, uh, of the C3 and C4 levels uh, with a uh, a cage uh, that was inserted uh, and uh, posterior fixation uh, because his bone quality was not ideal. Uh, you can see he was placed in a halo, uh, and uh, this was, uh, he, he did very well uh, after the surgery, and uh, he's actually, this is two, two years later, uh, he's now, uh, has recovered totally from his neck surgery, and, and has actually most recently just recovered from a uh, hip replacement, so he's finally walking again, uh, and is, is very happy.
Uh, this this patient, uh, you know, I looked at his flex sex films and I really saw absolutely no mobility. Uh, I, I put him in traction in the operating room and did his corpectomies. All right. What if, what if this patient was 70 years old? So, myelopathy has, has a situation with a fixed um, kyphotic deformity. Um, does that change your, your treatment? Uh, you know, with a fixed kyphosis like that, I still think that you're forced to do anterior, posterior, um, especially if you're doing a two-level corpectomy. Uh, if it was just a one-level corpectomy that was required, I think you could potentially get away with just a anterior-only surgery, uh, especially if you uh, use bicortical anterior screws. Uh, but again, it, it, with the poor bone quality, uh, there's a fairly high likelihood that you would end up having subsidence in the front. Uh, so I, I think posterior approaches are, are fairly facile and, and quick to do, and, and um, it's, it's not a bad idea to, to back up an anterior corpectomy, even if it's just a one level. Um, uh, especially, you know, uh, I, I think fairly soon, I'm not sure when, but fairly soon, um, if, if you've got a, a very good anterior decompression of the uh, stenosis uh, by doing a corpectomy from the front, your decompression has been accomplished. And uh, so uh, I'm fairly soon you, we're going to see more and more MIS posterior cervical fusions for backing up of cervical corpectomies, I think, uh, where you can just percutaneously uh, do a transfacet type fusion uh, you know, in the area where the corpectomy was done, uh, and uh, and that potentially would be a safe and quick way without the morbidity of the posterior cervical approach. Yeah, I was thinking more along the lines of, of a sim less, worrying less about the structural deformity and more about you know decreasing the, the likelihood of progression of the myelopathy. So doing it purely in situations like, like this, I've seen people do a um, just come from the back and just do a decompression. Um, or even put some lateral mass screws in just to, you know, to, to prevent any uh, worsening of the kyphosis, but worrying less about the deformity itself in the latter stages. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's always a dilemma what to do with a patient who can't really tolerate much surgery. Um, and the worst thing would, would be, to, you know, especially for like a high cervical lesion like C3-4, the incidence of dysphagia is fairly uh, worrisome, especially in an elderly person. Um, so, so there, there certainly are reasons why you make exceptions to the rule uh, not to re-establish cervical lordosis. But like we talked about again, part of the myelopathy is due to the ventral compression of the vasculature. Uh, and uh, that patient may not improve as much as, as they potentially could if you addressed the uh, the uh, the uh, kyphosis. Um, so it's a dilemma, and there's no perfect answer. So uh, th this this one is a globus cage um, that has a screw that is uh, integrated uh, into the the top and bottom of the cage. I think it comes in handy for. Uh, the C2 area, uh, where you don't want to have a lot of, you know, uh, you don't want a big plate in that area to that would result in occupancy of the uh, retropharyngeal space that could lead to dysphagia. Um, and it also, it's very often, that getting up to that area is not easy. And, and uh, you know, if you can access that uh, from, uh, you know, without exposing a lot of the C2, it comes in handy. So uh, the, the other thing is that, you know, we do routine ACDFs all the time. Uh, you know, this is an example of someone who had an older style ACDF with these cages that they're harms type cages. And uh, as you can see, this patient has subsided quite substantially. Uh, uh, as expected with these harms cages, which really have kind of like a sharp uh, ring, you know, with not a lot of uh, surface area. And uh, 
And so patients like this uh, are highly susceptible to developing kyphosis. Uh, so uh, this patient ended up having a osteotomy uh, to correct his, his uh, uh, kyphosis and had a posterior approach. Um, this could have been anterior posterior uh, as well uh, by releasing the ALL and putting in hyperlordotic uh, cages in the front. Um, but uh, this was one approach. And uh, so bottom line is uh, their cervical spondylosis and stenosis, uh, it's, it's an age-related phenomenon. It's routine collapse of the disc space uh, with uh, the evolution of bone formation from the, gener from the degenerative discs. Uh, and it's very common, uh, up to 95% of uh, men and 70% of women by the age of 60 to, to 65 have this. And uh, it may or may not lead to uh, progressive neurologic deficit. Uh, you're going to see these patients uh, every day uh, in clinic. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of factors to weigh into the decision as to whether you choose an anterior versus posterior approach. Uh, laminoplasty candidates are fairly rare because it's hard to find a patient with pure uh, myelopathy, you know, without foraminal uh, radicular symptoms, uh, with totally normal cervical lordosis. Uh, you know, not an easy uh, thing to to find that candidate. So these patients are mostly going to be amenable to either an anterior only approach if they're one level or two level disease. Uh, or uh, if it's OPLL, uh, you know, uh, posterior approach is probably quite reasonable to avoid the risks of, uh, of uh, CSF leakage uh, from the anterior approach that could happen with OPLL. Uh, and uh, so, so bottom line, there's, there's a lot of factors to consider. Uh, and uh, a lot of the time, it's just reflective upon where the pathology is. You know, uh, if it's anterior pathology, err on the side of anterior approach. Posterior pathology, posterior approach. And, you know, uh, assessment of whether or not the patient has uh, uh, lordosis is very critical in helping decide whether you do anterior or posterior. If they have no lordosis, err on the side of doing an anterior approach to get that lordosis back. Uh, but... You know, like we discussed earlier, that might not be uh, the best option if you have a really sick patient who needs a quick operation uh, to deal with a super acute issue that's going on. Mm -hmm.